you can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke is in the New Testament. It's one of the first few books. And I just have to say that if, if you all sound that good singing, and it's that much fun to sing with a group this size, can you imagine what it's going to be like to sing with all the saints and angels in heaven forever and a day? Wow. What a future we have in front of us. He is risen. This is the central truth of our sermon and our passage this morning, and it's been the words that I've been meditating on for the last six weeks. See, as I've come home from the day's work, come inside my house, greeted by my beautiful wife and my beautiful kids, there's hugs, how you doing, that kind of stuff, and as I walk into my kitchen, there is a sign that, that my wife, six or, six or seven weeks ago, put up a very simple sign, a very profound sign that stands as the light comes through, it hits it, and it just kind of glows in the kitchen. And as I stand there at the sink and do dishes, I'm staring right at it. And that sign says, He is risen. I've been looking at this sign for six weeks. They're familiar words, they're common words, but you know what? If you stare at those words long enough, they start to work on you. If you meditate on it and chew on it and think on it, he is risen, begins to work on your heart, begins to work on your mind, begins to work on your soul. He is risen. What a statement this is. What a truth this is, that he is alive, that he is not dead, but he is, in fact, risen. I've often stood there and just started looking at the words, and, I, and I'd meditate on one word for a while. He is risen. Who? Who is the he? Why does this matter that he has risen? Well, the he who has risen was the one who claimed to be God in John chapter 5. I'm going to read a lot of scriptures from a lot of different places today to amplify chapter 24. But this one who is the he claimed to be God. Verse 18 of John chapter 5 says this, this, is, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even, even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Who is this he? This he is the one who claimed to have power to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And yet, earlier in the Gospel of Luke, this woman comes into his house. He's dining with the Pharisees, and Jesus is reclining at table. He's eating, and this broken woman, it says a woman of the city, this sinner, comes into this house, and she begins to weep, and she anoints Jesus' feet with her tears, the, the tears of her, her brokenness and her repentance, and she anoints his feet with oil as she's repenting from her sins, and when she is done, Jesus turns to her and says in chapter 7, verse 48, your sins are forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. This he is the one who promised eternal life for all those who turned and followed him. We see that in John chapter 8, verse 51, where he says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Equal with God, forgiven of sins, and promises eternal life. This he was none other than Jesus, who we saw last week was brutally flogged, was whipped, was beaten, was then crucified, was stabbed in the side, piercing his heart with a spear, and was supposed to be lying dead in the tomb. That's who this he is. In fact, as, as our passage opens up, look, look in verse 1. The women are going to the tomb with spices. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. These 
spices like we saw last week that Nicodemus had. These spices were used to anoint the body so that the body didn't decay or decompose quickly. So they're going to bring spices. Why? Because he's dead. At this point in the story, it's, it's he was dead. But not anymore. Verse 2. And they found, as they went to take these spices, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, this was not at all what they were expecting. This is not at all what you would have been expecting had you made your trek up to do this, because a two-ton stone is not easily moved, And people don't usually want to go steal dead bodies. It's no wonder why in verse 4, as the description continues, that the women are described as perplexed. They are are confused. Where did Jesus' body go? Who stole the body? Why would anyone steal a dead body? I mean, that just seems to make no sense at all. They are perplexed. They are confused. One thing we can infer from that is that resurrection was not at the top of the list of their expectations of what was going to happen on this morning. It probably wouldn't have been on the top of yours or mine either if we had been there. I'm no medical doctor. I don't even play one on TV. I don't know much about the body. But I do know this. Most dead bodies don't move let alone get up and walk, let alone push aside a two-ton stone after being crucified and being pierced in the heart with a spear, let alone just off wandering the countryside. It just doesn't happen. So it's no wonder that they are perplexed and it's no wonder that there's no apparent explanation that their eyes could see. This is not a natural event. The naturalist, the one who does not admit that God can do miracles, that there is any supernatural takes place, cannot accept this truth. They cannot see beyond an empty tomb to a risen Savior. And so these women are perplexed until verse 4. So look with me in verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. These men show up on the scene glowing in their... White robes, you can read in Matthew that this is angels of the Lord. These are angels of the Lord. And one of the angels was the one who actually pushed the stone away. It's an explanation for how the stone got moved. And the women are frightened. You ever have that moment where you know something unique and different and perplexing is happening, but you don't know why or what. You haven't put the pieces together. You hear a strange noise outside. You start to hear sirens. You, start, you, start, you realize that something's going on, but you're not sure what it is. It's kind of one of these moments. These men up here, there's this empty tomb. They know something is going on, and, and they fall to their faces in fear. The presence of these angelic beings is enough to drop them to the ground. Verse 5, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? What a great question. They weren't there to seek the living, were they? They were there to seek the dead. He is transforming their thinking. Why do you seek the living, there's the first clue of what's happened, among the dead? Verse 6, he is not here but has risen. This is the heart of Easter and the heart of Christianity. He has risen. He is risen. My mind would shift from that picture from the word he to the word risen. Risen. What, is it, what does it mean that he's been raised? I mean, it means a lot of things. Did you know that Jesus knew that he was going to die? And did you know that Jesus knew that he would be raised? He knew he was going to die, and he knew that he was going to rise. He tells his disciples this three times in the Gospel of Luke. Now, we haven't studied the whole book, so let me just bring you into the spots. Luke 9, verse 22 
Luke 9, verse 43, and Luke 18, verses 31 through 34. The first one, Luke 9. He tells his disciples, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Then again, verse 43, But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. This was a restatement of what he had just said to them. But they did not understand the saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about the saying. So they're they're hearing the words, but they're not getting the words. And then again, Luke 18, verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon, and after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. The saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. They still don't grasp it in this scene. The women are there. They're bowed before the angels. That They still don't get it. In fact, actually, the angels are going to go on here in verse six, end of verse 6 through 7 and then at the beginning of verse 8, and they're going to explain again what Jesus had said. But there was no way for their minds at this point to get it. They were still confused. And that is exactly where we are unless God helps us to see this as truth. Listen, I am well aware, as, as, as is every other preacher who's preaching this gospel this Sunday morning, I am well aware that to, to a mind that doesn't understand God and his power and his authority over the earth, to a mind that, is, that does not admit nat- supernatural things, this seems like total foolishness or a lie or a myth or a made-up story. There was no one who was there to see this event take place except for the angels who peered in and perhaps the dirt and the rocks and the bugs that were on the inside of the tomb. They are the silent, privileged witnesses to the most powerful event that has ever occurred in all of human history. There is no challenger that can step up to the plate and challenge God's power when it comes to the resurrection and the magnificence of this event, and yet none of us were there to see it. We have to receive this news by faith and by evidence, the evidence that Jesus presents himself to his disciples and to many others after his resurrection. But we shouldn't look at these women and think, well, why why can't they get it? Well, we're slow to, we're dull to. The angels have to tell them again how to interpret these events. They say in verse 6, remember, remember, remember. He's already told you this, so remember how he told you. While he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Remember, he said this to you. And look what happens in verse 8. And they remembered his words. He is risen. Think about the present tense of that. He is risen. He said he was going to rise, and now he is risen. This is like the the light bulb going on moment for these disciples. This is the moment where it all clicks. They've they've heard him say that Jesus is going to die and he's going to be raised. And then now... He's done it. He is risen. This is the moment when the perplexion goes away and the confusion goes away and in its place is left great news. The good news goes to great news in this moment because he is risen. And these ladies pick up and they run. They run back to the other disciples. They run to tell them this news. They cannot help but run and go and share and proclaim and and tell. This missionary heart beats inside of them. And you know what happens here? This is the beginning. This scene here, which then Matthew 28 is the great commission of the disciples, but this scene here, these first witnesses, they begin what has become a multi-generational, 
multinational, multi-ethnic mission of spreading this great news that he, the one who was crucified for our sins, is risen. It's what brings us here together this morning. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, why does all of this matter? I mean, I could see this being something that the disciples would run to the, the women would run to the disciples you know, for, for like an entertainment value. You know, when something amazing takes place and you want to bring all of your friends to come see, come check this out. You've got to see what took place. Here's a guy who can juggle fire or something like that. You want to bring everybody to come see, but not because you think it's going to change your life, not because it bears any claim on your life, but, but simply because you want to be entertained. Is that what's happening here? If that's the case, then does the resurrection actually mean anything for us? Or is it just this jaw-dropping, wow kind of moment? Wow, that was amazing, God, that you did that. That was so cool. But has no bearing on us? No. No. Most certainly not. The resurrection means everything for us. The resurrection proves that everything that Jesus said was true. The resurrection confirms Jesus' own words. Think of it this way. If the resurrection doesn't happen, then Jesus is a liar. And if Jesus is a liar, then he cannot atone for our sins. And not only is Christianity lost, but you are lost and I am lost. We preach the gospel as this message of atonement for sins. There is no gospel without the cross. But there is no gospel without the resurrection either. The the cross and the resurrection are inseparably linked. They hang together closer than the closest of friends. They are two parts of this great proclamation. The cross is atoned for our sins, and the resurrection is God's statement that I have indeed kept my words. I am a truth teller. Sins are indeed forgiven. Consciences can indeed be cleansed. And salvation has indeed been accomplished. Think about this. This has been the central hope for the nation of Israel for thousands of years as this history leads to this moment of this cross and this resurrection. And from here, it shoots out all across the world. What does the resurrection mean for us? Well, we've looked at most of chapter 24. We're going to come back to the ending at the end of the sermon. But Luke has done his job. Luke is recording history for us, this narrative. And he has done his job. He has given us the facts of what has taken place. But you look through the rest of the New Testament and you see the other writers giving us the significance of the resurrection. What is the significance of the resurrection? I'm going to give us three three significance this morning that can give us hope as we think about Jesus being the one who is risen. First, because Jesus rose, he is the king. Because Jesus rose, he is the king. The resurrection actually cements him in this place of authority. We see that in Romans 1, verse 4, where the apostle Paul writes, he writes like this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, Here's all this history coming to pass. And verse 4, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. The cross is the ultimate picture of weakness and of suffering and of humiliation. And one can easily gaze too long upon the cross and and misunderstand that our Lord, our our Savior Jesus, is not a, a weak and suffering king. He is an exalted king. He is an exalted Lord. So where the cross teaches atonement for our sins, the resurrection declares Jesus as the forever exalted king over all of history. We see that in Philippians chapter 2, where after taking us down this pathway that leads to death, 
Then the scripture says, therefore, as Jesus dies on this cross, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus Christ is Lord by the resurrection. He is exalted as king, which means he's not just king over the Christians. He is king over the earth. He is king over all. He has authority over all. He's bringing people into his kingdom so that he can give his loving authority over them as a good king, as a righteous king. But listen, we, first thing we should see is this resurrection is that we are not the king. There is a king who stands in heaven, risen. He is Lord over all, which means that his word stands over us all. He is our authority, which means we are to obey him and to follow him. Whoever keeps my words will never taste death. The byproduct of the gospel working out in a life that's lived towards God is life. So this king reigns, and what has this king done for us through this resurrection? Two, because Jesus rose, we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven because of the resurrection. Now think about this. What do you think happens when you die? Lots of answers to that question over the centuries. Everybody has a different idea as to what happens when you die. It's one of the most important questions you can actually ask because you are going to die. Every one of you in this room, young to old, find yourself with the effects of sin, which is death. And so you should ask the question, what what am I going to do when I die? What's going to happen to me when I die? What will take place to me when I die? In Greek thought, the idea of death and then a resurrection, that was foolishness. The Greeks would not have wanted to find a resurrection taking place because they thought that death was freedom from the body. So you have the good part, which is your soul, and you've got the the bad part, which is your body. There's a quote from a book called Greek Humanism. Charles McKenzie wrote this. The human soul, this is Greek thought, the human soul is a virtual prisoner within the body and a true philosopher lives to die. Death is not an enemy but a friend because it releases man to inhabit the eternal world of ideas. At death, we finally get rid of this old constricting baggage we carry around. Death is man's great emancipation. The idea of a resurrection was foolishness and yet... The early church preached the hope of the resurrection into a Greek culture. They preached that death was not emancipation, but death was a holding place until judgment took place. They preached that through Christ you could be raised from the dead and that you could pass through this judgment. So you see in Acts chapter 4, verse 2, that as the disciples are preaching, the religious leaders at this time, the Sadducees, they're getting annoyed at the disciples for this talk of resurrection. It literally says that. It says they were greatly annoyed. It's like, come on, what are you talking about? That's foolish. Matthew 22, verse 23. Mark 12, verse 18. The Sadducees did not believe in bodily resurrection. Same thing in Acts 17. Until Paul preaches this sermon in Acts 17, until he gets to the point where he says, resurrection from the dead, and then it's over. It's like, oh, everything else you were saying we can hang with, but as soon as you mention resurrection, ha, 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 what a fool you are, and they mock him. But the disciples knew something that their culture didn't know and that our culture doesn't know and doesn't believe, and that is judgment is real, And judgment is coming for sinners when they die. The resurrection actually stands as proof of this very fact. We see this in Acts 17. After they mock, this is what Paul says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. This is Jesus. 
And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection stands as this proof that there is one who will judge at the end. Hebrews 9, 27 goes on to tell us the same truth. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. The biblical understanding of death is not reincarnation. It is not annihilation. It is resurrection. All will be raised to stand before God at the judgment seat. Which means that even if your car doesn't work, or even if you don't have food in your cupboards, or even if you are under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure and confusion and perplexion in your life, it is not the biggest problem that you face Your biggest problem this Easter is the same problem you had last Easter, which is that there is a day coming and you need an advocate. It's your sin and your rebellion against God. It's mine, too, all of us. Underneath the pastel colors and the nice coats and the, I would say, beautiful hats, but no one here apparently likes hats. It's Arizona. Underneath the the Easter dresses, there is a sinner. And we're all made up of that. Every one of us, standing inside pretty new Easter shoes, there is a foot connected to a sinner in a room full of sinners, in a country full of sinners, in a world full of sinners. Sinning is just, sinning, that word is a biblical word. It means the impulse to live your life apart from God, in disagreement to God, without concern about God, to just do whatever you want to do. You become your own God. That's what sin is. And we are alienated from the true God because we alienate ourselves from God because we put ourselves in the place of God. That is sin. And that is not a small thing. The Bible tells us very clearly that it is is like a crime against the Creator to have cast Him off His throne as the rightful King. And we are all guilty of this crime, which is why the resurrection matters. Because if the consequences of our sin is judgment... Then, then unless there is a way that we can be forgiven, then we have no hope. Because Jesus rose, we can be forgiven. Because Jesus rose, we can be forgiven. Look, you are closer to that day than you were last Sunday. You are much closer to that day than you were last Easter. The day is coming And because Jesus rose, we can be forgiven. As we saw last week, Jesus the king, the rightful king, doesn't come as a king. He comes as a servant. He comes as a sacrifice so that our judgment on the cross could be placed upon him. He became the willing substitute for us. He stands in our place. He takes the wrath that we deserved, the punishment that we deserve for our sins so that God could say, you are pardoned from all of your sins and you are forgiven. How do we know it's true? Because Jesus has been risen. If Jesus stays dead, he's just like every other leader of every other religion that's ever been conceived of. Religions that tell us to follow the rules, but make you follow a dead leader. But the good news for us is that our God is not dead. He is surely alive. And the resurrection proclaims God's victory over sin. And so when Jesus says on the cross, it is finished, he is not first and foremost talking about the physical punishment he was experiencing. He is talking about the satisfaction of God's wrath for your sins upon him. And that is finished which is the ultimate demonstration of God's love for you. Do you realize that? Can you conceive of a greater love? I mean, Jesus himself on this earth said, no greater love is this than a man lays down his life for his friend. Well, how about a man laying down his life for his enemies in such a way that secures for them pardon, forgiveness, 
we come to this Easter and we realize what forgiveness means, it, it's, it's the statement that you can't be outside of God's love if you're a Christian. Do you honestly think that there is something you've done, something you've said, something you've thought of? Do you honestly think that there is something like that that is greater in power than the power that raised Christ from the dead? Are you going to trump God? Are you going to one-up God? Is there anything you can do that's outside the scope of his forgiveness? If God set his love upon you while you were still enemies of of him, at the peak of your unlovability, will he not continue to love you? Even if that love means discipline, Hebrews 12, so that he can put inside of you this transformation that brings you to the image of Christ, makes you into the image of Christ. J.C. Ryle said this in helping us understand this love. He said, The love of our Lord Jesus Christ for sinners is strikingly shown in his steady purpose of heart to die for them, even when they didn't understand what he was saying or what he was about to do or why he had to do it. Think of it. All through his life, he knew that he was about to be crucified. Wow. Can you imagine? I mean, it's hard enough when we know that there's something out there in the future that just kind of nags you and weighs on you. All of his life, he knew he was about to be crucified. There is nothing in his cross and passion which he did not foresee distinctly, even to the minutest particular, long before it came upon him. He tasted all the well-known bitterness of anticipated suffering, and yet he never swerved from his path for a moment. He was straightened in spirit until he had finished the work he came to do, and he was alone in that knowledge. Even when he tried to explain it to the disciples, they didn't understand. Yet he lived in this isolating knowledge for them, and he loved them when they didn't understand. Such love passes knowledge. It is unspeakable, unsearchable. We may rest on that love without fear. If Christ so loved us before we thought of him, he will surely not cease to love us after we've believed. So you sit here today as a Christian. Because Jesus died, you are forgiven. God promises that we have been forgiven through the death and resurrection of his son. 1 John 1, nine. So the gospel tells you that you are guilty but pardoned. And the gospel empowers you to go and sin no more in light of this forgiveness that you have received. That was second. Third and last, and probably most obvious, because Jesus rose, we know we too will rise to everlasting life. It would be one thing if God simply forgave us and then if we ceased to exist. But that's not what the scriptures teach. As Christians, the resurrection is somewhat of a foreshadowing of our own future. In him we rise. In him we will have our day in the ground and we will have our moment of of resurrection. That's why Paul says in Philippians that he wants to know the power of his resurrection because it is the thing that raises you from the grave. And as Christians, we don't just rise to face judgment. Yes, there is a day of judgment, but as Christians in Christ who has paid our debt in full through faith in this one who has risen and who has paid for our sins through him, we pass through the fires of judgment into everlasting, increasingly joyful life with God himself. That is your future. I don't know what jobs you all have or what careers you aspire to have or what you want to do when you retire, but let me just put something out there beyond that. Everlasting, increasingly joyful experience with God is your future if you trust trust and rest yourself on this death and resurrection It is our hope to pass through the fires of judgments. We see this as a promise in the scriptures, Romans 6, verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, 
we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. 1 Thessalonians 4, our bodies will be resurrected. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. That language is for those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Look at what it says in verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Brothers and sisters, Take courage today that this is true. That beyond your retirement, there is this moment that leads into everlasting life. And on that day, all of our great enemies will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death itself has been conquered by death in Christ and his resurrection. This gospel is great news if you're eight years old. This gospel is great news if you're 24 years old and in perfect health. But this gospel becomes even greater news the older you get. Or if your health is failing, or if you find yourself in the hospital over Easter, like some of you did last year, or if you find yourself facing some sort of diagnosis that doesn't seem to have any earthly cure, this gospel, which was good news when you were seven, is great news when you come to the end, because if you don't have the hope of resurrection, you have no hope. But we have a hope that we too we'll have a resurrection to everlasting, increasing joy in Christ. According to his great mercy, 1 Peter 1.3, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Is that your hope this morning? I've read a lot of scriptures, I've kind of bounced around, trying to show the significance of the resurrection and how the New Testament writers saw this event and saw its significance. And I, I just scratch the surface. There's more. But you have to take a position. This, this truth calls you to take a position. You have to decide. Do you believe in this cross and resurrection? Or is it like in Luke 24, as we go back to our text, the response of the disciples on that first hearing, verse 11, as the women go back and tell them what they have become assured of, verse 11, but these words seemed to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. It can't be both. And what's going to matter for you is not that you came to church on Easter in 2013. What's going to matter to you is what you do with Jesus and his resurrection. Christians continue to do with, continue to believe in this Jesus all the way till the end because what matters is us believing. So there's two ways. There's two paths. There's two positions. Either the resurrection is an idle tale, which is a statement of your unbelief, the Bible says that for all who are in that spot, when they die, they face judgment for sins and eternal separation from the goodness of God forever. Who would want that? Or 
belief in what is a historic fact and what is the greatest news in all of history, that Jesus really did rise from the dead by the power of God. And all who believe in him by faith receive salvation and forgiveness and joy and transformation. There's transformation now, not just the day you die, but God begins to work in your life now, today, for, for a hope. And you have a future beyond the grave. On this Resurrection Sunday, let me plead with all of you to choose the path of Christ, to put your faith in Jesus' death for your sins and his resurrection as the king so that you can find forgiveness and that you too can have the assurance that you will have everlasting life with him. 10,000 reasons to bless his name forever. Let's pray. I know, God, that many people in this room have come to this belief. You've helped them see what the disciples could not see. You've helped them to see, and they've put their faith and trust in you. And I absolutely worship you for that, God. Thank you for doing that in my life 17 years ago, which has changed the course of my earthly life forever and will extend into eternal life. But, God, I'm... I know that there are people in this room who are visiting this Sunday or who are regular attenders but who have not believed that you, Lord, want to show this truth to again today. And I I pray, Father, for all of them. I pray for everyone in this room, kids, adults, that you would help us, Lord, to not just walk out of here and think, wow, what a nice message. That was entertaining. But to come like these women and, and see and believe that he is risen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.